Hello and welcome! You are listening to Elden Kings, an Elden Ring discussion. Tonight's topic is the Elden Ring DLC and more, with a special guest from the Square Table Gaming YouTube channel here to visit the Round Table Hold, uh, Zaki Malicious. Welcome to the Hold, how are you doing today? I'm doing good. Um, so, so my real name is Zach Grubb. Uh, Zachy Malicious is my Discord tag from when I was like 16, and it just kind of stuck around. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's important to clear up, you know. So, <laughs> I'm happy to officially welcome you to the Roundtable Hold, Zach. Uh, thank you again for joining us today. Would you like to tell us a little about your uh, your YouTube channel, Square Table Gaming? Sure thing. Um, so I'm first off incredibly excited to be here. I love any chance I get where I can just sit down with someone and actually talk Elden Ring. Um, I know those of us at the channel do it together all the time, but it's nice to talk to people who aren't completely involved in whatever I'm working on. Um, <laughs> so the channel started almost a year ago now. Um, we're actually coming up on one year, I think at the beginning of April. And it was started as kind of, um, you know, a an overall hey we're in this group chat every day we're talking about video games we're talking about the industry let's actually try to do something creative with it um and i started creating the elden lore series because at we were like a month into elden rings release and i realized no one was really talking about these incredible enemies that we kept facing like i one of the first things i i wrote about was the crucible knights because i thought they're like all the information we could find about them was so cool and interesting and I couldn't find a single person online talking about the Crucible Knights. Um, so it's kind of how I started the channel. Uh, it was all purpose at first, and then honing in on Elden Ring when I realized there was kind of this open niche for talking about individual characters and enemies. That makes a lot of sense to me. You know, the 16 elite knights of Lord Godfrey are certainly like a mythical sounding uh story so i get why you would focus on the crucible knights to begin with and then just branch out from there and like there's definitely a niche most people just talk about like elden ring macro concepts or like the story of the lords but they don't hone in on like you say the enemies or uh you know like the lore that's like really in depth like that i feel like you've done a good job from what i've seen of your channel like in examining parts of the lore that haven't like yet gotten a niche and what other people talk about so thank you i really appreciate that like i feel like elden ring is the first time i've had so many pieces of equipment drop that told me so much about these individual characters <laughs> and i just felt like somebody needed to be talking about it yeah, I agree. I mean, that makes a lot of sense. Like, we've gone from, uh, like, older games where there's just not enough content to really get into such micro details. So there's definitely, like, a more well-rounded world that's going on in Elden Ring. Um, from what I saw of your channel as well, it grew a lot in that first year. You know, I saw that, like, you know, some of the first videos you had had maybe, like, 100-ish views, and then you just bumped up into, like, 100,000 views or, you know, 40,000 views and stuff like that. How did that feel to sort of, like, get that wild success going right off the... Not right off the bat, but soon after, you know? It was mind-blowing. I really did not expect it. No, none of us working on the videos we were were expecting it. Um, you know, it's. I feel like it's so hard to break out in on YouTube, but I think because the first video that really like launched us was the Crucible Nights video, um, and I think we just hit the niche at the right time. And YouTube's algorithm was like, oh people are looking for this and no one has any content. Let's show off these guys. Like, yeah, they don't have any. Yeah. They've got like 30 subs, but people are searching. Um, and it literally skyrocketed us. It was the most surreal thing. Having a video go from like 300 views in its first week to like 300,000 views a week later. Um, I remember one of the first things I did was try to figure out like, what does this mean? How many people is this? And it was like, oh, the number of people who have watched the video can fill a football stadium. Yeah, it puts a little perspective on like the number once it gets to the point where like human comprehension has trouble fully recognizing it. Yeah, it's it's ridiculous. Um, and basically, since I, since then, it's just been look. 
I enjoy doing this. I'm just going to keep making these videos. I like doing it. And whatever happens, happens. I think that's the best mindset for it. You know, it's something that you enjoy. It's a hobby that could become something more. And for now, you're just sort of like riding with it, not letting anything go to your head, but also just putting your full, like making sure that it's quality work that you put out and stuff. It's like a satisfaction to that. Absolutely. And I think like early on, one of the first things I did after we got monetized was to just invest in better equipment. Um, the PC I'm using now is something I never would have like considered getting for myself if I didn't really, really take off with the channel and th start thinking like, I want to make this better. I want anybody who's listening to us to have the highest quality possible. That makes sense. I imagine you invested into some of those like high specs on microphones and like uh, RAM and GPUs just so that you could get the full recording and editing and uh, uh, all of that equipment going to you know full full throttle. Yeah, it, it is. It is night and day listening to like one of our first five or six videos compared to what we're doing now, just because of the quality of the recording equipment. And you said that you started this channel with like a couple of friends. Do they have specific niches of their own that they go into uh, while you have like your Elden Ring content or do you collaborate? How does that process look like for your video making? So it, it depends on the video. Um... You know, I work a full-time job, so sometimes it's really difficult for me to get all the footage I need. And uh, so the team is myself, uh, my older brother, Pat, who does all the artwork for the channel and who does the, most of the game reviews on the channel. Um, my younger brother, Jesse, who uh, is more along the lines of like proofreading my scripts, checking lore to make sure I'm not missing anything big. Um, <clears throat> my brother-in-law, Matthew, who is Big Booty, who does the Big Booty Boss Battles videos. Um, and our buddy Augie, who was on a lot of the early videos and is kind of looking into maybe doing some content uh, based around Nier. Oh, it's like a family business, you know, <laughs> it's just a bunch of brothers and friends. Yeah, it was. Uh, it <laughs> that wasn't really the idea starting out, but we we had the group chat, and it's like, oh, okay, so I'm just going to do this with like my family. <laughs> yeah, I bet that's like you know a new type of bonding, you know. <laughs> I can Absolutely. imagine making videos with my own brother. It's sort of funny to imagine, like, writing scripts with them. So I was actually, you answered one of my follow-up questions about artwork, since I noticed that a lot of your thumbnails have some pretty in-depth and cool-looking artwork that features different, you know, characters from Elden Ring or other media you've done. So that's your older brother? Mm -hmm. Yeah, that is uh, Pat G. He does all the artwork for the channel. Um, I make sure to include his art pal in all of the description lines because if anybody likes, like, really, really digs any of the artwork that we're using, it's all up there to, like, buy his prints. Oh, sweet. Okay, I'll link that below as well. So for if anyone's interested, we'll, we'll get that in the description for you. That would be awesome. Yeah, I know he'd appreciate it. Um, I, I, think, uh, I think working on the Elden Lore series has made him uh, pretty happy. I, I haven't seen him this happy doing artwork for me in a long time. <laughs> Oh, that's good. It's like, uh, I've heard that with artists, you know, there's like when you get some sort of specific purpose to making something, it can like enhance the drive you have behind it. So it's cool that he's enjoying it. Yeah, and I've, I have always loved his artwork since we were kids. Like, he has always blown me away. Like, he's my, honestly, my biggest inspiration in being creative is, is my older brother. Absolutely. Oh, that's sweet. I, I totally get that too. Like I have some artist friends and seeing their dedication to putting out like a full sized artwork piece that like I can't even comprehend the creation process of. It's just like it's inspiring for me to edit podcasts or write stories or write essays and all of that type of general creation y stuff. Absolutely. Like he's yeah, he he's he's the reason I'm a writer. Uh you know, whether it be in my free time or as as something for Elden Lore, like yeah, it wouldn't exist without him. Absolutely. So uh, the name Square Table Gaming, I imagine that's something you came up with uh, together then? Is there, like, do you have a story behind it at all? So it was actually kind of funny because none of us could come up with a good name for a YouTube channel. And it was just like, well, we're just going to sit around talking about games, right? And I'm like, yeah, um, these conversations we have get pretty heated. And it kind of seems like it wouldn't really be a round table discussion because we'd constantly be arguing with each other. So I thought, okay, why don't we call it square table gaming because everyone has a point and uh, nobody's listening to each other. <laughs> um, 
<laughs> and now nowadays I realize that it sounds a lot more like we're a tabletop channel. <laughs> a little bit, a little bit, yeah. <laughs> but I mean, you know, maybe you can branch into that someday. <laughs> I would love to. We're no, we're all big tabletop fans, but <laughs> who knows? Yeah, I think I'm just gonna, I'm gonna keep focusing on Elden Lore and try to just whatever whatever grabs us. Makes sense to me. I definitely think there's an irony here with uh, the round table hold inviting the square table gaming to <laughs> um, <laughs> join us in our podcast. But I wasn't gonna say anything, but I, I like that was my first thought. I love that. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, so, speaking of interests and, like, you know, writing Elden Ring lore, whatever interests you, is there anything lately that you've been working on that you want to tease, that you're, like, sort of, that's hot in the mind that you want to talk about? So, are we talking, like, for the channel, or just generally? Uh, either or. I'll leave it up to you. Um, alright, I've got a couple of things. Um, so for the channel, I like to... Every now and again, we put up a poll asking people what they'd like to see, because very early on, it was about kind of giving the community what they wanted and finding out what people wanted to learn more about. Um, and honestly, I attribute a lot of our success to that, just asking people, you know, what do you want to learn about? And we'll dig into it for you. Um, so we ran a poll pretty recently about like, hey, our one year is coming up, like one year of Elden Lore, what do you want to see? And the biggest, the big winner on there has been um, like a one year lore retrospective. And what I'm working on is kind of a video going back over our first year of writing Elden Lore and talking about specific areas where I think my mind has changed due to community feedback. Uh, because that's all this that's all this is really. Like I, I know I know the big lore guys out there are typically seen as like infallible when it comes to their readings of things. And I'll be honest, ninety nine percent of the time I like I agree with Vati. You know what I mean? But I feel like the conversations that we have in our comments that go over the different people's different ideas about these characters have honestly changed my mind on a bunch of points that, you know, we've all read about that we've all written scripts about. Um, so I want to go back and kind of say, Hey, after a year, here's where you guys have changed my mind about things. I like that. It's like, like you said, a lot of what you make is about, catering to the audience you have and like knowing your audience so it's sort of awesome that you can have this idea of a one-year retrospective where you go through like not only a recap of the lore that you've learned throughout the year but like also the places where you've changed your mind like that's a great way of doing audience interaction and just like sort of celebrating elden ring's general anniversary as a whole i like it thank you um, I also want to turn all of our videos into like one 10 hour mega video. Uh, that's going to take a little more work because I have a lot of old audio that needs to be re recorded. <laughs> that's sort of cool. It's like a remaster, the, the cumulative master video. Yeah. One of the weirdest things about doing this, and I keep seeing it in every video we post, I get at least three or four comments about people saying, like, hey, could you make like a really long video so I could just listen to you talk while I fall asleep? And I'm like, that's super weird, but, like, thank you. Uh, yeah, I'll do it eventually. <laughs> That's, like, I've heard about people using Dark Souls lore videos specifically for that. It's, like, ASMR made-up history or something, where people just love to hear someone talk about, like, <laughs> like this, like, complex topics or whatever that pops up in Soulsborne, and then you just... Like, that's so interesting to me. It's like Snowtown, Vatty Video, all of the big people get stuff like that, too. Yeah, I had never I had never heard about that until I started getting comments on it. And it's like, you know what? If people are if people are digging my voice. Yeah, I will. I will get that. I will get that done for you. Um, I don't see the appeal only because I hate listening to myself speak. But cool. I'm glad you do. <laughs> <laughs> I understand that so much. I'll get to the end of editing one of these podcast episodes and I'll be like, oh my god, why did I talk so much? Like <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, you come you become numb to it after a while. Like I've had to I've had to like clean up so much audio of myself just reading scripts into a microphone where it's like, yeah, I don't even hear my voice anymore. Yeah, you're like you're not even listening to the speech. You're just listening to the spaces in between audio that you want to clean up. It's like you're, you're dead to it a little bit. Yes. <laughs> like, oh, did I repeat myself? Did, okay, I need to cut that breath. Okay, move on. <laughs> exactly. Okay, so let's uh, let's 
I mean, if you don't mind, let's get into Elden Ring lore itself a little. And I don't know about you, but whenever I go onto Reddit or Tumblr or Twitter, there's like always just debates everywhere about who people's like who who has the favorite character, who's the best like waifu or who's bando, so to say, or like who's the hardest <laughs> <Absolutely>. boss. <laughs> uh, so I'm curious, like, do you have any? Uh, do you have a two cents on the matter? Do you have a favorite NPC quest line or boss or uh, favorite ending type? My favorite quest line was, oh my god, how am I blanking on her name right now? She was like my favorite video to make. Um, the, oh my god, the the girl who <laughs> came from uh, Melania, her, her daughter. Oh, oh. Um... Millicent, Millicent. <laughs> Millicent. Oh my god. <laughs> <laughs> yes, Millicent was my favorite quest line of the game. I super don't like how it ended. Uh, I, I understand. It's like the ending of any typical from lore or from quest but uh i really really don't think she should have just chosen to die at the end i think we could have had something really cool with the idea of her getting to melania and presenting the needle herself you know what i mean uh her, her quest should not have ended with her choosing to just d d take out the needle give it to us and let herself die um that was easily my favorite npc quest though toughest boss <laughs> this is going to sound ridiculous. The toughest boss for me was that freaking ice dragon. Oh, the Borealis? <laughs> yes. Uh, you know, give me Melania any day. That ice dragon drove me crazy. And I <laughs> oh don't gosh. know why. It has a lot of health and damage. It like... does. <laughs> I think part of the problem, too, is I was like... When I when I fought it originally, I was running... You know, it was back in the day. We were all running bleed builds. I had my dual katanas, and I was like, God, just bleed already! And it just wouldn't go down. Um, I haven't revisited that fight in a while, mostly because I just don't want to do it. <laughs> I completely get that. Like, you just have something that happened. Like, you just have a bad experience with it, and you're like, nope, I'm not, I'm not doing that again. Not dealing with that. Yeah, I, like, uh... I can find, I can even find the fun in fighting the Elden Beast. But, like, I cannot go back to that freaking dragon. <laughs> <laughs> That's completely understandable. That's sort of interesting what you said about Millicent, too. It's, uh, I get where you're coming from. She would have been, like, a cool summon for Melania. But also, I, I sort of like the bittersweet ending of her questline. But why I bring it up is because my last guest, Quayleg, she really likes Millicent's questline for the purpose that she dies at the end because of Gowry, and Gowry was one of her favorites. <laughs> it's sort of funny to see that sort of recur an episode later. <laughs> It's um, there's something really special about that quest line. Um, I mean, when you think about it, how many other characters actually like follow a path the way that Millicent did? We get a little bit of that with uh, Gold Mask, but I feel like it doesn't hit the same. Um, and she she's one of the few people who really feels like your comrade on your journey. You know what I mean? Yeah, absolutely. Like she fights. Uh, like, she fights her own path, and then, like, fights alongside you numerous times. And she makes the biggest NPC traveling distance. Like, she goes all the way from Kaled to the Halig tree. That's, a, like, a full circle of the lands between. Yeah. I mean, I'm probably the only person who comes close is Alexander, making his way to farm Azula. But, like... And, yeah, Alexander is also probably, the, like, the second best NPC quest in the game. But, I don't know. I don't know what it was about Millicent. That was also one of my favorite videos to make. Um, just because I, I had so much passion around that storyline. I can see that. She's a very cool character. Honestly, when I first played the game, I thought she was Millennia. I thought like the game was going to build up to her regaining her memory and becoming a boss fight, and I was completely wrong. But <laughs> I, I did too. I did too. I thought that too. I, I thought there was more to it. I thought she was going to become Millennia. Yeah, exactly. Like, you know, you would get her all the way there, and then she would just like turn on you, or you know, something incredibly sad, but I get where they're going yeah. with it. <laughs> also, the idea that um, the idea that Melania could have children, quote unquote, through the bloom of the rot, like their flowers blooming, it adds a lot of um, mystique to just how these demigod demigods like reproduce. Because there's a lot of there's a lot of contention between you know, are America and Radagon two separate people or not? Uh, like obviously within the Earth tree they are not, but were they beforehand? Um. And, you know, there's people who are diehard. Yes, they were always the same person. They were not two separate bodies. And there's people who think they may have been two separate bodies. 
And like the idea that these demigods can reproduce without, you know, traditional means, it really throws the whole concept of, well, they needed to be two separate bodies for a loop. Um, I'm actually still in that camp that at, at least at some point, I believe they were separate from each other. But I mean, I understand how much evidence there is pointing, pointing the other direction. Yeah, it's certainly a highly debated topic. I'm personally in the opposite camp myself, where I'm like, if the game goes to such lengths to tell you that they're literally the same person, I feel like you have to sort of like walk back from the concept to think that they were two people. But like, there's so much evidence in either direction that like, I, I think you can definitely at least argue a lot of different points of view, if not like, you know, be completely solid in what you say, just because it's, it's, it's such a mysterious game. And like you say, like, the fact that birth is in it works in such a odd way with different examples. Like Rikard has his snake children from eggs that Tanith like cultivates or like incubates. Mm -hmm. You know, like Melania, you know, she's got her flower children, obviously. Like Renala has an entire theme about rebirth. And like they're not literally her children, but like you know, there's just so many there's so much weird shit going on with birth that you know, it calls into question a lot of things that we would have previously taken for granted. Absolutely. And I mean, it, you know, it also, it also kind of makes sense of Ronnie to a point because we, we understand that an Empyrean has to be born of one God, according to the brief amount of writing that we get on that. Um, so for Michael and Melania, it makes perfect sense. They came from one God. They came from America, who is Radagon. They were together. Whether they had two bodies or not, them being together means they came from one God. But for Ronnie, that never really made sense, unless Melania and Radon were already one person at that point um, when they were with Renala. Um, I don't know. I think I think it might actually clear up that whole discrepancy. But again, nothing is set in stone. Just as a side note, I think you said Melania and Radon instead of Merica and Radigan in terms of Ronnie's. Yes, I did. <laughs> <laughs> but I, apologies, like I said, six hours. <laughs> Like I said earlier, I'm running on six hours of sleep. <laughs> yeah, and honestly, Elden Ring can be a bit name salady at times. It definitely can. Um, I think that's interesting, because I've never actually... So, I sort of... Like, you're coming at this from like this perspective that Empyreans are always born of one god, which is a perspective I didn't really consider much. But then you've already made like a way to logically conclude how it still works, like with if Merrick and Radigan are one god, then they might have been the sole, you know, at, like, parents of whatever. I feel like once right. one possible detractor from that would be, like, wouldn't all of the other Carrion siblings be Empyreans? But then you could just assume that Renala's involved if you're going at it from that perspective. Uh, but right. I would like to put forward one possible counterpoint where it's like, what if an Empyrean is someone that's chosen by the two fingers naturally, and when they're chosen, they have some sort of process happen to them? Like maybe it has to do with the Great Rune of Rebirth, where they are given Empyrean flesh. Uh, since like Merica too is an Empyrean, and the Glomide Queen is apparently an Empyrean, so like you'd have to explain their parentage with gods as well, within like the view of that they're always children of gods, and that like there's a specific mm -hmm. case study where it's if two Empyreans were to mate with each other, or if one Empyrean were to do whatever the hell Merica and Radigan were doing, then uh you know you could just have fully Empyrean children who are then cursed on account of being flawed from being born of one being. It's like a uh I don't know, it's like it's like mythological genetics. Like if you <laughs> if you don't have enough an, genetic that oh go on. There's an interesting call out there too though, because we talk about what would happen if two Empyreans had a child. Uh to my knowledge, I can't remember exactly where this idea was pulled from, but I know it was very popular in the earlier days. Empyreans, as we know them, are only female, aside from Mikola. Yeah, so like Mikola is the only male Empyrean, and presumably the only reason for that is because he was born a twin. That's a good reasoning, the twin, the twin thing, and like he is a very feminine person as well. So like even within Mikola's study, it's like he's still very goddess esque. Very much, yeah. So. Like, in order for Empyreans to be born, it seems like it can't be done naturally. Yeah, I think that, like, whatever the case, it's not just, like, there's not, like, there's never a case where someone's just born an Empyrean randomly. Like, you either need the Empyrean lineage, or you need to be, like, chosen for it. 
if being chosen for it is a thing, since in the presumption of, you know, it only being a birth and it's like special occasions. Yeah. And I mean, it, they do say that Ronnie, Ronnie says she was chosen by her two fingers. So the idea of an Imperium being chosen is also like, it, it, it makes sense. It, it's there is precedent for it within the game itself. Absolutely. You have to assume that, that like, in my opinion, I think it's a combination of people can be chosen for it and people can be born into it. But like, there's precedence either way. It, the game totally leads you into being able to. It gives examples of everything, I guess. <laughs> and that's why we're all always arguing about it. <laughs> yeah, I've uh, I've seen people on Twitter uh, compare it to like religious arguing, since it's just one body of text and so many, so many perspectives and ideas of how it works together, which I think is sort of funny. Absolutely. So, uh, moving on, Elden Ring has announced its DLC very recently. I made an entire video about it. Pretty much every Soulsborne YouTuber <laughs> has made a video about it. It's very, very exciting. Uh, I know that you've made a video on it yourself. Do you have any like insights you'd like to talk about? Any hype that you'd like to share? So, um, in my video, I it was I, I got it out there pretty quickly. Um, I think I woke up that morning, saw the announcement, watched or like w looked at the image and immediately started trying to draw lines in my head and like write a script on what I think is going on. And since my vi since my video came out, I've seen a lot of really well thought out theories about what's going on. Um, originally, I had thought that that was Mikola riding Torrent heading to the Hal Halic tree. Uh, the gold pouring from the tree, I thought, was the unalloyed gold that gave life to the Halic tree, which would make sense. You know, if, if something is wrong with it, if it's rotting, if it's turning black. Yeah, it would be pouring its lifeblood from itself. Um, but then there's people out there who have said that this tree is, you know, t two other trees wrapping around the earth tree. I understand where that idea is coming from. I don't think that's what's happening, though, because I don't think the space that we're seeing exists in any place in the lands between that we have seen so far. This is a new area. It's either the realm of dreams or it's um, an area of the map that we haven't been to. My favorite theory out there right now about this is that that's a elephant tree. And the gold that we see inside is, um, like, I think one of the item descriptions describes it as likened to grace, but not quite. Yeah, the the oft-overlooked item description of the Helfen steeple, which very briefly yeah. mentions an Elden Ring afterlife with almost no elaboration, as if to tease us about things that we barely know about. Yep. Yeah. You can you can loosely tie it to the death birds. Oh, absolutely, because they're all involved with destined death. Mm -hmm. I think uh, to <laughs> when I made my own theory, I went sort of entirely crackpot on it, just because like I, I I'm sort of deep into the mythological inspiration of Elden Ring, especially from Norse mythology and Gaelic stuff. So when I looked at it, and I I immediately was thinking of the Helfen. And I was also thinking of the idea that the Erda tree is inspired by Yggdrasil. And one of Yggdrasil's key components is that it's a yew tree representing life and death. Yew trees are like poisonous, fully lethal to humans mm -hmm. and most other things. And it's got like, its branches reach up into the heavens while its roots reach into the underworld. And its roots are eternally rotting, just like how the Erda tree's roots in the Nameless City are rotting. So there's this other concept that's called like as above, so below, where the top like existence of everything is mirrored by an underworld. You know, like Stranger Things with the upside down is an easy sort of example of that in current pop culture. So it's like, you know, like you say, if it's the health and tree, then it's the afterlife. So we might just be looking at an inverted uh, uh, an inverted lands between, you know, a completely new area that's sort of not a new area because it's <laughs> just like the underworld, but this is so. It would many... also make sense of the hundreds of ghost images we have in there. Yes, exactly. And uh, there's even like if you look at certain afterlifes, like mythological afterlifes, a lot of them sort of begin with a field of grass. I know that Egypt does specifically. There was like this really good tweet, mm -hmm. Twitter thread about that. I read it before. And also, if you look at George Martin's, um, his. Game of Thrones book series, the Dothraki in it, they have a sort of myth about this field of grass at the end of the world that's sort of the afterlife, and 
you know, both of those could be likened to that wheat field that we see in the image. I absolutely see that. No, no doubt. <laughs> so yeah, it's, it's like, very fascinating. It makes, I think that makes perfect sense. And I mean, that would even tie together the concepts of uh, Mikola and Godwin, since Godwin seems to be this, you know, agent, his body, his leftover body is this kind of agent of destined death just spreading throughout the roots of the Earth tree. So, I mean, there, I, I think there's a good, there's a good concept here for how their two stories are going to intertwine for this DLC, especially because I think we entered the Land of Dreams briefly to fight uh, Grand Sax, not Grand Sax, um, the dragon who was closest to Godwin. Yeah, for the Sax. Fortisax, yes. Very interestingly, when you're in the dream of Fortisax, you have this, uh, the skybox. It looks like the skybox that's used in the Dung Eaters ending, like the cursed omen thing. And that's mm -hmm. sort of alluding to the rotting of the roots in similar ways. And that sort of all connects to, like, Raincor and, like, <laughs> it's like it like you can have like this sort of switch over where like it represents rot and curses and defilement. And if you look at the Wraith Callers, who are these people that use bells and like you see them in the Shaded Castle and in Leonia and in Elphale, so they're sort of loosely linked to Mikola on account of that. Um they summon like those spirits that have the sort of omen effect where it's like this greenish, blackish Rencor spirit. And all of that's just like <laughs> I can't formulate it in my head right now. I'm appal I apologize, but it all sort of loosely connects together into this like a like reference towards corrupted spirits that are dead. So I feel like all of that within the scheme of death plays into could play into this in some way. I wish I could explain it better. I I see where you're going with it though. I really do. Like it's it's a bunch of pieces that are almost fit together and I feel like this DLC is going to do it. It's going to give us those missing bits that we need to link it all together and this image is specifically designed to get us thinking about that. Yeah, I agree so much. I guess one thing I will touch on is that uh in cut content Mikola had this twin blade. It was like the uh, the staff of rot and of like decay and abundance, where like one side was blessed and the other side uh, was rotten, of course. And this is like you know it could have been a reference to mythologic myths where the Dagda, which is like the All Father or the king of the Celtic pantheon, or at least for a time he was the king. He had a staff that like used life and death in a similar way. But where this is really getting into is that, like, if we have the as above, so below analogy, then we have the abundance with Mikola and the lands between side and the rot with Godwin and the death side. And if we're looking at this as Mikola going to the afterlife sometime in the past in response to Godwin's death, we can look at it at the, um, there's this myth in Norse mythology where after Baldur's death, um, his wife, Nana, goes to the afterlife with him. And Nana is sort of characterized as like a fertility goddess of abundance, which closely resembles Mikola. And what, why this myth is important and very interesting is that Baldur is like the sort of immortal son of the Allfather, who is impervious to all damage. So if we look at his analog in Elden Ring, who is Godwin, who was the impervious son of the Allmother, America, you know, she's like the queen of the pantheon then you can see him as, like, his death starts Ragnarok, and, you know, Godwin's death is a prelude to the Shattering. So there's a lot of, like, mythological inspiration we can sort of look at about this. I'm sorry, I'm sort of, like, I'm talking a lot about it, but <laughs> I hope you find it No, I'm, I'm enjoying it. It's, that, it's actually funny to me because you remember a little while back when the Game Awards were going on, people were talking about, like, oh, best story, God of War or Elden Ring, and it's like, guys... You have no idea how much these actually overlap. <laughs> <laughs> they really do. They really do. <laughs> it's very funny. Like I, it's these are really strong. Can like I, I really dig your concept here. Um, I feel like it works really well with what we know and what we've been given. Um, it's funny because the only thing I thought about when I when I read about that cut content about the staff of rotten abundance was uh, the relationship between Melania and Mikola. Uh, you know, one of them being two halves of the same coin. Uh, Melania cursed to rot and uh, Mikola cursed to be young but to kind of 
again be like that golden child. Yeah, because he's like, even though he's forever young, that's like for eternal youth is in some ways a sign of abundance because you're eternally at like, exactly. the sort of most growing point. And I think that's definitely what it was sort of intended for originally. Like, I feel like a lot of earlier designs of Elden Ring were sort of, I won't say less complex, but they went a different direction where like Mikola's story was more about acceptance of the fact that he's two halves of the same whole, you know, like, like him and Melania would make up like the two sides of the Tao, for instance, where you have like good on one side and you've got bad on the other, but like they're both inherent to each other. You can't have one without the other. And like, if you look at the, there's two dialogue lines from cut content it's like i read it in like this wem map that sakura Dubi made and it was really interesting it's like the first one implies that mikola is present for melania's boss fight and that during her boss fight he would grant her like the last drop from his uh great rune of abundance and that would be what revitalizes her into her second phase. Like, what we know now is that she blooms, and that's why she becomes, like, the second phase Scarlet Rat Goddess. But in the cut content, it would be Mikola learning to accept her and aid her. And then after the fight, if he went up to Mikola's husk, where he still is, since Moog didn't steal him in that plotline, you'd be able to get, like, a mending rune or some sort of, like, item that would allow you to get a Mikola ending where he talks about how all things malign and graceful can live in harmony, in a way. And I feel like that would have, like, that would have summed up the the Scarlet Rot and the Omen, and it would have just, like, been, you know, a happy ending, so to say, but they they cut that <laughs> and went whatever, I, wherever, whatever direction they're doing now, you know, but Anyway, that was. I wouldn't be surprised. <laughs> I wouldn't be surprised if we come back that way. There's no way that this expansion doesn't come with, it, in my opinion, at least two new endings. Um, just based on the way that Elden Ring does their endings with mending runes, I feel like it wouldn't make any sense to introduce all of this new content. And I'm saying all of this new content because, yeah, we only have this one image, but I think their language and calling it an expansion is very deliberate. And there's going to be so much more to this than any of us realize. I think. The concept of not having new endings with this expansion seems silly. I was also thinking during that, uh, during during what you were saying about the original concept for the Millennia boss fight, where Mikola would be present. You know, there, there are people who truly believe that he actually was that Moog didn't truly steal Mikola. I don't know how on board I am with that, but the idea that the Mikola we see in that egg isn't truly him. I don't know how much evidence there is for that, but it's an interesting concept. I think. I Nicola's I, entire point. Oh, sorry. No, no, you can finish. You can finish. I, I just was going to say that I think that there's. I can think of a few theories that support what you're saying about Moog not stealing Nicola fully. Yeah. Um. The point of Nicola, it seems, in the early version was for him to be that you know brighter side to the darkness that it, that would come with the rot from Melania. I really don't want to say that anyone ending is going to be a true ending or even a good ending because no matter what ending you get in elden ring it seems like somebody will be unhappy and i think that's the point um there is no one path for the lands between and if we did go this route of having mikola be like this or giving you this rune that would lead to you know essentially abundance and happiness across the land and acceptance across the land it wouldn't really be true to the themes of elden ring I agree with that. Like, I really agree with that. Like, they all of the endings in Elden Ring have their own sort of spin and motif, where, like, if it seems evil, then you can argue for the fact that it's good. And then if it seems really good, you can argue for one of the reasons why it's evil. Like, there's a perspective in it that matters. And, like, all of the endings have, like, a sort of dichotomy with each other. Like, Frenzied Flame is offset with Ronnie's ending. And the Dung Eater is offset to, like, you know, Gold Mask, as if to say that, like, if there can be a perfect order, then there can also be a perfectly cursed order. Um, so for there to be any ending introduced within the DLC, which there probably will be, like, Dark Souls 2 DLC gave its own ending, and the Bloodborne and Dark Souls 3 endings, while not, like, their DLC, they didn't physically change the ending cutscenes, but, like, they give you a new ending to the story that's all, like, arguably yeah. more important, you know? Absolutely. Um, oh, I actually thought, um, w when you mentioned that they changed the fight for Millennia, I wonder if they did that because they didn't want to 
they didn't want to kind of do the Lori and Lothric thing again. Yeah, I um, I think that's very possible because it's like when they changed the fight for Melania, like it came with the like taking away the easy answer of just making rot combine with abundance and making everything good. And like they gave it like the tragic spin of Moog stealing him, possibly at least mm-hmm. killing the Halic tree. But like, I I lost the thread. Oh my goodness, I'm so sorry. Oh yeah, like <laughs> I I just may- maybe they didn't want to repeat themselves by you know mid battle having the the sibling oh. come in and empower their their old their older sibling. You know what I mean? Yeah. No, that's a very good point. Um, I was before we got the DLC image. I was ironically a proponent of the idea that in the DLC, Mikola would get a Lothric Lorien fight where he's helping like a blue silver mimic lord or Godwin or something like that. Um, but like, I can really see them not wanting to repeat themselves. Like Lothric Lorien is one of the arguably most finalized fights in Dark Souls 3. Like, it's something where they were like, okay, this is what it is. This is how we wanted it. So I feel like there's not much to iterate on from that concept. So I can see why they just, you know, like you say, they wouldn't want to repeat it because there's no need. I agree, but what you just brought up about the idea of Mikola helping a silver mimic, that's so cool. <laughs> that is such a cool idea. <laughs> oh my god. You would not believe how long I've loved that theory. It's like, Okay, it, it, it's crackpot as hell. Like, it's a Vike posting level theory. Like, it's it, it's basically... Um, Mi- Mikola's all about unalloyed gold. And if unalloyed gold is inner order, and outer order is, like, silver, because, you know, silver and gold, then when Gold Mask <laughs> balances the order, he balances it mathematically between gold and silver. And that's, like, you know, the house of the golden lineage and the house of the Carrion family. Like, there's all... There's themes about it all over the place. You even see it, like, Definitely. the dagger that kills D. Like, D is made of gold and silver, and he has a dagger that's made of gold and silver, but then Thea steals it and corrupts it with death and kills him with it. And it's like, the go- the inner and outer order is ruined by dust and death. Like, there's so much there's so much going on. So Mikola... But also, yeah, it drives his brother insane, too, and forces him to be an agent of death. Exactly, yeah. Yes, yes. <laughs> so Mikola is like, if he's all about unalloyed gold, and he's all about learning the depths of the Order, um, it's possible that he might have wanted to learn how to balance the Order. And now the cut Silver Azimi questline is basically you get like a silver tier, and it mimics you. And since you're the player Tarnish, you're the main character, you're going to be Elden Lord. And the point of the blue silver is to make a perfect Elden Lord, something that's better than the main character that won't die and fail like Godfrey did. And that's like the Sovereign Eternal. So like all of the Eternal Cities, especially Nakron, wanted to make a Sovereign Eternal to rule their Lord of Night so that like the age that comes after the Golden Order would like be eternal. <laughs> and um, because of that, you find the Mimic Lord... Uh, like, not the Mimic Lord, but the Mimic Tier Ash, it's still in Nakron, you know, just because it's, like, okay. a, like you know, they, they didn't we, cut all of the lore, they just reworked it. Yeah, we actually did a video on this. We we did a video on the Mimic Tier, um, and, like, what it was and what it was supposed to be. It's actually funny, when we did that video, I had no voice, I was sick, and uh, Pat G, my older brother, stepped in and did the audio for it. <laughs> oh, that's awesome. <laughs> so we had him we had him acting as my Mimic Tier for the episode. <laughs> <laughs> that's a fantastic idea it's like you but just a little bit different <laughs> exactly yeah <laughs> but yeah so you're familiar all, with all of this then so i'll skip yeah the, the idea of asami but yeah bringing mikola into it that's interesting i had not considered that yeah because okay so what what gets me is that you find the mimic tier in two places only as a boss fight you find it in nakron where you originally got the ash of war and then they moved the ash of war to a chest in nakron uh, but the other mimic tier is in the secret path to the Halig tree. It's in Mikola's domain, and like Mikola it also had... carries a piece of death root. Exactly. There's so much like together with it. Mikola had a very specific interest with the Elbenorix, who are made of blue silver. So if Mikola's interested in balancing the golden order with his unalloyed gold, then maybe he wanted to like get a perfect example of blue silver, like a sovereign eternal, to be his lord. And like if you look at it as like he sees Moog and Millennia who could be lords in a way. Like they they're both really powerful fighters. Their strength is like they have the strength for it. But they're tainted by like what they represent. 
you know, if Mogri the Beat and, Lord. Well, and their outer gods. Exactly, yeah. Like, they, they're tainted, you know? Like, if they were to be Lord, they would destroy the Order. And that's not what Mikola wants. Yeah. Right, Mik- Mikola wants to create a new Order. Mm-hmm. And by, you, you know, with Melania, it would be tainted by the god, like, the outer god of Rot, and with Moog, it would be tainted by the Formless Mother. So yes. neither would work. So all of that accumulates in, like, if, if Mikola's trying to make the Sovereign Eternal, then maybe that is, like, a secret thing that he's going for. So then, then the question is, you know, the question is, who, who is to be Mikola's consort? The silver, exactly. sir, uh, the silver Eternal or Godwin? Yeah, yeah. If we're gonna get, like, a fight like that, you know, like, is Mikola gonna be in the afterlife with Godwin? Is he gonna be, is he gonna have a sovereign eternal? Is he gonna be well, a glomide queen? You know, I mean, like, what, what's going on? Well, Mikola, Mikola once, at least according to what we can learn from the ghosts um, in the, sh- in the, castle in Soul. the north, in the castle, yes, in Castle Soul, Mikola wants a true death for Godwin. He wants the eclipse to happen so that Godwin can have a true death. Because as as it is right now, he can't. He, he's completely incapable of having a true death because of his soul being separated from his body. So if Godwin were able to have a true death, maybe that would make it possible for Godwin to again act as Mikola's consort. That's definitely a possibility. Like It brings in the question what a true death means. And I guess, yeah, like he could be Mikola's consort. And it's like in the Prince of Death ending... Well, the Duskborn ending, he, Godwin does rise again, allegedly as the Prince of Death, on the completion of the Hallowbrand. So is that the Eclipse in question? You know, like I that... don't think so because <clears throat> because in rising to that, he is still he still has a soul separated from his body, mm-hmm. and I think in order to die a true death, you need to be separated from the Earth Tree. That's possible. How do you feel about the possibility that the ghosts, when they reference it, uh, Godwin's inability to die a true death? They're referencing, like, a history where Mikola would have allegedly helped America in the plot of the Night of the Black Knives, where the plot was originally to incur a true death into Godwin, but they failed because Ronnie, at the time of Godwin being slain, also slew her flesh, so he died half. You know, it says that he died a half-death in Soul Alone. But what that does physically within the game is it cuts the Hallowbrand in half, So if he were to have died in both soul and body, the Hallowbrand would have been complete, which could have been seen as a true death, and maybe that would have let him rise again immediately. Uh, How does that, like, what do you think of that, I guess? (laughs) I like that as, I like that as an idea. Personally, I am more of the opinion that Marika wanted all of this from the beginning. And I think that harkens back to the fact that we know Marika, Marika sent the Tarnished away at a time well before the shattering she knew that eventually we were going to be needed to fulfill our purpose in taking the elden ring and becoming the new elden lord so in my mind if marika knew and sent us away specifically because we were going to have that purpose in the future there's no way that the events of the shattering would have happened without her express knowledge and even participation participation I think if we went that route where the hollow brand could have been completed, then we don't necessarily have a shattering because Godwin is not Godwin is brought back immediately and the uh, impetus for the shattering disappears. But I think all all signs point towards the tarnish being sent away specifically because Marika knew she was going to, sh- to shatter the Elden Ring at some point. And the death of Godwin was her excuse to finally do it. OK, so I fully agree with what you said. Like, I it, I guess it's convoluted to say, but, like, I have taken that into account. And the uh, the reasoning behind it... And I, I love the... Like, it's a, it, that's a fantastic rebuttal. And that's totally, like, if you're going to go with that theory, like, that is the reason to go with it. But consider, um, what if Marika, from the get-go, she knows that her order is imperfect? Like, if you look at the... Uh, Gideon gives you the spell, divine, the Lord's Divine Protection... And it says that Gideon Mm -hmm. learned the true wisdom from the two fingers. The Erda tree and the fingers themselves were, they were broken long ago. So the order from the beginning of its conception is imperfect. 
So Merica, from the time of banishing Godfrey, would have known this. So that, you know, obviously she knows a shattering is coming because the order is imperfect, and that all fits into what you said. Um, mm -hmm. So because she's anticipating this, she attempts a last ditch, ditch effort to save the order, which is why, she, you know, like, you know, I don't think any... I, I'm sort of America apologist in a way, so I like to think that she... Sort of like, you know, like, it's sort of like Dune, where a lot of her hand, her hands were tied in the situation, and it was sort of like, every option is bad, so I'm going to go with the least bad option. But, like, you know, Paul Atreides in Dune kills, like, 47 billion people, so, like, <laughs> you know, people, heroes do evil things, and all that. Right. No, I totally see that. So, Merica, in a last-ditch effort to avoid the coming shattering, which she knows will happen because, like, during the age of Radigan, Radigan's super imperialist. He's, like, super... He's, like, inquisitorial. You know, he's cracking down. But because he's cracking down, he's driving the Order farther apart in a desperate attempt to bring it together. So, you know, the Order will collapse one day. So, Merica's like, I'm going to sacrifice my firstborn son to try and create an age of Duskborn, where immortality, I'll put dust and death back into the Order Tree, something I fed, you know, that was my mistake originally, and that will fix things. And the fact that it fails is why she shatters the Elden Ring. It's like, she, she doesn't expect that it'll work, but she wants to try anyway. And some of that is based off of the idea that out of all of the endings, all of the, like I mentioned that they were offset with each other last uh, previously, the only ones yeah. that don't have opposites are the Lord of Fracture ending, which is the default, and the Lord Age of Duskborn ending, which I think is because like of the three mending runes, you get Goldmask and Dung Eater, who are humans. It's the human guided path of embracing their own like defilement and evil, or trying to be better. But then you have, like, the divine option, where Merica's plan is still in action, and she's still trying to cause an Age of the Duskborn, since we don't know who hired Fia. But, it, you know, it could be implied that F Merica is who got Fia to work for her, so... You know, that was a long, rambling theory, but I hope it made sense. <laughs> it does. Um, I, w I wouldn't say I'm 100% on board, but, like, every point that you bring up makes sense. None of it works like counter to any other ideas that i've encountered so totally get where you're going with it absolutely yeah and i think that's sort of the cool thing about elden ring you know you don't have to be 100 percent on board but you can read or hear or listen to someone's theory and you can be like well damn that does sort of make sense from a logical conclusion it's like the stuff like Mikola's soul is still in the hell lake tree i read about it and i'm like i'm not i'm not on board with this but like there's no i mean like it's totally viable it could be true yeah, absolutely. Like his body stopped growing after reaching Moog. At least it seems like that's what happened. So what happened to his consciousness? Well, maybe it lives within the hell. What maybe it lives within the Haley tree? Like we have nothing to say that yes, this is what's going on, but it makes sense. And that's so much of like lore diving and exploring for Elden Ring. It's just asking yourself, does this make sense? And in a lot of cases, it's like yes, all of this adds up. Like one of my favorite um, theories about Radagon is the concept that he broke off from America due to the Fell God's curse. That America was one person, and after defeating the giants, the Fell God's curse was placed on her, which caused her to split the curse off from herself, creating Radagon, which would explain Radagon's red hair and his tie to giants. It makes sense, but we have nothing concrete to hold on to for it. Absolutely. And yeah, it's it's honestly one of my favorite sort of theories with no real sort of tangible evidence beyond just like a vibe. So, right. And and the red braid that tells you that Radagon hated his red hair. Like, yeah, that's that's really it. And it's like reading through the cut contents, I feel like it really could have been part of what like a more concrete inspiration originally that like was then changed so much that it wasn't really intended as much anymore because it's like in the previous iteration of the game in my opinion at least this is like my own speculation on cut content but like it seems like the frenzied flame used to be a lot more to do with vengeance than with misery like it was about how divisions and it was like about cycles of violence and how they just like turned everything into infinite bloodshed and that's sort of why the lord of vengeance from cut content is mostly the lord of blood now because moog's entire vibe is people 
you know, always going at war with each other. And the Land of Reeds is a really good case example, where it's like, it's a land beset by blood shadow. Yeah. And no matter <laughs> how many times they tell us the Land of Reeds is not Sekiro, we're going to keep saying it's Sekiro. <laughs> Yeah, we get the prosthetics and everything. It's it's hard to yeah. deny. It's, it's, like, guys, come on. You can't drop that in our laps and expect us not to draw that line. <laughs> <laughs> They're just waiting to do, like, a the From Software cinematic universe. It's like, Give me a solid writer and I will get on board. <laughs> <laughs> It'll be like Subspace Emissary from Smash Bros. Brawl. Oh, my God. <laughs> You know what? That's it. Now I now I want a from soft uh, party fighting game. I need it. <laughs> I need all of the best NPCs in a party fighting game. Be great. You just get like a bunch of Siegmeier alts. Oh my god! How many patches? Oh, no. And every single one of them needs to fight differently. <laughs> the spider patches is just like off the wall. No, if spider patches doesn't get to be playable. He gets to be like a swinging in the background of an area. <laughs> <laughs> There's always one of them. So everybody can argue over whether there'll be DLC at some point. Exactly. He's the Waluigi of the From Software universe. <laughs> that's actually, you know what? I think that's a fair statement, regardless of this joke. Patches is the From <laughs> Patches is the Waluigi of From Soft. <laughs> <laughs> now we need like a a Patches tennis mini game or something just to top it off. He can just play doubles with himself. Easy. <laughs> Speaking of patches, did you know that 1 in 5 players murder their in-game patches on site? That's right, this is a cutaway geared towards raising awareness about patches abuse, a transgression that goes unpunished all too often. Poor Patches, the lovable scoundrel. Even if he survives first contact, his mortality rate only grows as the playthrough progresses. And even if he survives, almost 50% of players never buy from his shop afterwards leaving him to go hungry. By the way, did you know that 60% of all statistics are made up on the spot? And that 100% of the ones in this monologue are? Uh, this message brought to you by the Patches Emporium. In more realistic news, there was an interesting discovery that runs around Twitter the other day. It concerned the God Skin duo boss fight, which has a bugged out mechanic where one God Skin can wake the other up if it falls asleep. Basically, a built-in function to counter their weakness to sleep, which once again brings into question the lore implications of the godskin being weak to sleep in the first place. The discovery is also just an interesting look into the game mechanics in general, since the wake-up effect plays by checking the other conditions of the other enemies in the level, and then acting accordingly. It's bugged in their current boss room because of the banished knights leading up to the fight. Like, there's something about one godskin detecting the other that it just can't see. And uh, we found out about this, at least in the mainstream, and I did find out about this, by Little Eggy, who's a streamer doing... who's a streamer. He was doing a randomizer run, and he was against the godskin duo in the Erdetree Sanctuary, the place where you fight gold for it. And... Uh, while he was doing, while he was there, they were able to do the feature because there wasn't any enemies around that could bug it. Anyway, this is also a segue into talking about Elden Ring Forged, a mod made by Kernafir, because in that mod they actually re-added this function, which they found um, while coding the game, the, while coding the mod in the first place. It's a really interesting mod too. It works as a complete overhaul to Elden Ring that tries to stay lore friendly but it also adds new concepts to the gameplay. Coolest among them is a deflection system from Sekiro, which, while Elden Ring doesn't need it, so to say, and it wasn't originally built for it, it's an awesome addition that adds entirely new defensive options to the game, which, like, you know, that adds so many more interactions. There's also a uh, faster mount speed, revamped scaling, compatibility with the seamless co-op mod, and it's just very cool in general. Like, if you have the game on PC, I would strongly recommend checking it out if modding is something that goes your way. Anyway, that's enough of this. Let's get back to the episode. It's funny. I have always wanted to make uh, a Patches video, but there is so much to talk about, and it would involve so playing so many different games just to get the footage for it. It's, like, completely out of 
my grasp until like unless I were to make YouTube my full time job. Like it, it's it's just not gonna happen. It's like the uh, the white whale of content writing. It's just like mythical. It could be, but it's it never will be. Yeah. <laughs> so okay, when it comes to the DLC, I love the fact that Mikola is riding Torrent. I'm really all on board for the concept that Torrent's original owner was Mikola because it's completely out of left field, and I want to know how and why. And also, that implies a relationship between Ronnie and Mikola. Yeah, it implies so much previously, like, unspeculated lore. Like, I used to think that Mikola and Merica and Ronnie were, like, in the conspiracy together, and, like, of everyone, like, you know, they're Empyrean, so, like, they're in the know. But, like, there is so much more beyond that now. There is... There's just so I I can't believe that they linked so many things just by having Nicola riding a horse, you know, like now we have all of this full blown political discussion about why Ronnie knew Nicola, like what was going on. Yeah. yeah. And like it, it I mean it makes sense that Torrent would belong to Nicola because Nicola like Torrent is definitely tied to the primordial crucible. He has all the harm, hallmarks of a creature from the crucible. Um and Mikola wouldn't care about that. Mikola is the kind of character who would see anything from the Primordial Crucible as deserving of more than what they currently have in the Golden Order. So it makes sense that Torrent would be tied to him, and that line has never been drawn in my head before this moment. Well, before, you know, seeing the image. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And, like, even if you look at Torrent's whistle, it's made of gold. It just doesn't specify unalloyed gold, but, like, it could be. It could be. Also... Off topic from Torrent, but um, how do you feel about the debate over whether or not this is actually Mikola? Because I'm going to be honest, I feel like it's pretty silly, but people are very adamant that this could be a young Marika. Uh, yeah, I, I'm sort of agreeing with you. It feels like it's sort of pushed for needless reasons. I don't, like, there's not really much evidence at all. Like, you know, like, even the braids that Merica has, they don't fully match up to that hair either. Like, Mikola's is closer of the two if we're comparing, and I don't think we should hold artists to such a hard comparison. It's sort of like the whole, the blood-letting beast isn't Lawrence because the scars aren't a one-to-one -one matchup between two pieces of media created by two different people to serve, like, you know, they're just referencing each other. It doesn't have to be a one-to-one -one design, in my opinion, but, like... Right, and honestly, I think it is pretty close to a one-to-one -one design with the Im the only image of Mikola we have, which is him being held by Moog. It's extremely close. Yeah, it, it's much closer yeah. than what we see of Merica by far. And like even oh. beyond that, it's like if we're going to be looking at the speculative methods of this being younger Merica, like out of all the possible ways you can view that tree, like if you want to see it as the future Erd tree being strangled, if you want to see it as the Halig tree, if you want to see it as the Halfen, uh, like if it's to be like some sort of ancient great tree that's being strangled by the Erd tree, or like I don't even know, like I feel like the the past of Elden Ring is like the least amount of sense that you could place this entire image for so like and that's the only place it works for merica because she's a husk at the time of the game and she's always a yeah we've never seen what she would have looked like as as a as a child i mean yeah the the concept that she would look like mikola sure mikola is inc from what we know very feminine uh you know classic from soft we have a strong magic user boy who looks feminine we've seen that before that's that's in their mo but like I don't know. It, it's just it's too it's it's too out there for me. Like we have this very clear, easy answer. And yes, is it possible they're going to throw us for a loop? Sure, but this seems too simple. Like it seems like we're being given the information, we're being given the image. That's not something we should be questioning. With everything going on in this image, that's not something we should be questioning. Yeah, that's that's well said. I would completely agree with that. There's still a lot of debate around St. Trina and Mikola, too, and that is, I think that's a little more understandable. <laughs> what, uh, what, what kind of debate exactly? Uh, whether or not Mikola and Trina are literally the same person, or if maybe they were, you know, two aspects of the same person in the way that Marika and Radagon were. Um, honestly, I just, I'm pretty straightforward about this. I, in my mind, St. Trina is Mikola. St. Trina is just the name Mikola took to walk amongst the people. 
Yeah, that's actually pretty much exactly what I've thought. Like, I, it's either that Nicola willingly chose to be Saint Trina as an alter ego while disguising himself, like you say, to walk amongst the people and do the things he couldn't with his noble title, or it's yes. like if you want to see it in like a more fantastical way, it's sort of fun to imagine that like Nicola is sleepwalking while he does that. It's like sort of like hidden, sort of repressed emotion and personality manifesting in the ego of Saint Trina, which is sort of like if you want to liken that to how Merica manifests as Radigan which seems to be unwilling, at least in my opinion. There's like a sort of motif, but I don't know. It's... Yeah, I think I think it speaks more to, uh, if you're, if you're going to go that route of them being two separate bodies, I think it speaks more to Morgoth's ability to have projections of himself. Moog as well, where we can have this Moog defending the Frenzied Flame ch uh, church, but it's not actually him. It's an image of himself that he sent out. There's Margit the Fell Omen. It's not literally Morgoth. It's a projection of Morgoth. We even face another one on our way through, you know, on our way through Landell. Like, we know they have the ability to do things like that. I'd be more willing to accept that than to accept that they're literally two aspects of the same person. You're saying that you would accept that St. Trina is a projection before you'd accept that it's another aspect of Mikola? Or are you saying that you'd accept it as a yeah. projection before it? Okay. So you yeah, think that personally, Mikola... I just think they're the same person. But but a projection of Mikola is Saint Trina. Sure. Yeah, I, I, I could I could see that. Okay. But you don't believe in the idea that this is tr uh, Mikola sleepwalking or like as an aspect of Saint Trina. Just to clarify, I wouldn't say I don't. I had never heard that that theory before, and oh. I think that theory would actually work very well from a gameplay perspective. Because that creates a situation where we could play the DLC with Saint Trina as an ally, kind of leading us through the story until the reveal that Saint Trina is Mikla. Okay, yeah, that makes sense to me, and that sort of fits with oh, like. I, I actually like that idea. <laughs> well, that's good to hear because yeah, I, I like the idea of like alter ego sleepwalking as a possibility, or at least the very least, like as a ploy, just a disguise. Yeah. Lot a lot to pull from this one image. <laughs> oh my goodness! Yeah, I um I hate to say it, but the video I made was like forty minutes long because I kept quoting from like uh I don't know if you've heard of it, but the Wizard of Earthsea book series, which is like the afterlife in that book series is both a afterlife and you visit in it in your dreams. So like. There's just, I don't know, there's like, there's a bunch of similarities, I feel like. I, I haven't, but I would absolutely check that out. Absolutely. If anyone likes, like, fantasy novels, especially ones that are told from the point of view of, like, people that, like, you know, it's told from the point of view of, like, heroic tales and stuff, but it tells them in, like, a much more human way. It's, like, in some ways a coming-of-age story, in the sense where, like, you learn about, it, it, like, the themes are humility and coming to peace with death and stuff like that, rather than, like, defeat evil, you know? I think they're fantastic books. I honestly very fully believe that Miyazaki references them a lot, since, like, there's moments in the books where, like, it talks about how the lightning of the gods and the dragons was uh, combated by the sorcery of men. And there's just a lot of, like, ref like you know, like, the whole DS1 Big Hat Logan having soul spears to combat, like, match Gwyn's lightning it's sort of I feel like that's like a motif that's borrowed my wife and I have been trying to read more like that's kind of our resolution for the year is to get more books under our belts and I I'm definitely gonna add that to my list <laughs> okay absolutely I very fully recommend it it's written by um a woman called Ursula K. Le Guin who in my opinion is one of the like I think she, she's just, like, she was so smart. She had so many, like, she read a lot of sci-fi and fantasy, as well as just, like, essays and, like, you know, like, philosophy and stuff. And mm -hmm. she, honestly, in my opinion, was, like, a freaking genius, way ahead of her time in what she was, like, writing about and what she was doing and, like, the way she saw human society and all of that. It's very, it's very interesting stuff. I'd fully recommend all of her work. Thank you for the recommendation. I'm definitely checking this out. Uh, well, I mean, within your resolution, have you read any other interesting books so far? So, uh, I have two under my belt so far for this year. Uh, I, uh, I read Dead Space Martyr because I was really, really excited for the Dead Space remake. Um, that is one of my favorite horror series of all time. So I read Dead Space Martyr, uh, and I just finished a book called Whisper Down the Lane, which was pretty good. 
Okay, that's pretty cool. What was Whisper Down the Lane about? Um, so it, it's funny. I I didn't know what it was about going into it because I bought it from this bookstore that was doing this thing where it was like go on a date with a book. Uh, so all of the books were just in brown paper bags, like wrapped up in brown paper bags, and they just had their themes written on them. So it was like go on a blind date with a book. You don't know what you're buying. You just know the theme of the book. Uh, and it was very much like a like a kind of a mystery psycho thriller kind of thing, uh, where the main character doesn't really know if the things that are happening to him are real or not. He doesn't know if he's the one doing them. Um, it involved a lot of um, a lot of psychological trauma involving children, which did not grab me. And uh, not gonna lie, I felt a little icky, but it did make a good story. Okay. Well, I'm glad that, like, overall it could be rated as, like, competently put together, even if it wasn't as much to your tastes as it could have been. Well-written book. Very well-written book. Would definitely, you know, if you're into if you're into psychological mysteries, worth picking up. Definitely. Just, um, I feel like ever since becoming a dad, anything involving kids hits different. I fully believe that. I feel like I've heard that from a lot of other parents. Like, once you have that sort of protective care for a child, like, a lot of stuff where you see children put in danger or, like, hurt, it's like, you know, you've got, like, feelings of empathy going on and it just hurts or hits different. Yeah, like, this this would not have bothered me two years ago. I'd have been like, ooh, that's interesting. Now I'm like, ooh, okay, all right, get through this part. <laughs> oh, boy. It sort of sounds like, uh, I read this book called The Last House on Needless Street last year or maybe a year and a half ago. And it was essentially, it's uh, just, it's like a multi-POV book, and it's you, do, you don't fully know what's going on. It's psychological horror in the same way, and it has a lot of traumatic stuff going on. And it features, like, abuse, and, like, you know, like, you know, there's children, a child involved, mm -hmm. like you say. So it's, you know, it definitely, like, you're reading it, and you're like, oh my god, Jesus, you know, stuff like that. Yeah. Yeah, I just, I, I don't know. I, I probably, I probably, these days, I probably wouldn't be able to take it. Maybe when she's older. My, my daughter's only two. Maybe when she's like, you know, 10, I'll be able to go back to those kind of things with a fresh perspective. But uh, yeah, right now that like, like you, like you said it perfectly. I think that that protective parent instinct just hits me different. That makes sense. Okay. Well, uh, is there anything else you want to cover before, uh, before we let you go? Um... So just for, for anybody out there starting out as a YouTuber, uh, I have one piece, of, one piece of advice. Make sure you pronounce something wrong in your videos. <laughs> to get, if like, you a want, comment. I will elaborate on that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. I, wanna, I think I've heard this before, but I'd like to hear you say it. <laughs> so we've said, I think at the beginning of the episode, we talked about how my uh, Crucible Nights video was the, like, the thing that, made, that launched us. I pronounced... Ever jail, ever gowl. And I would say I received somewhere around a thousand comments telling me to pronounce it ever jail. And I sincerely believe <laughs> that without those comments, we probably wouldn't have gotten boosted the way that we did from YouTube because it created so much engagement. People telling you you are wrong creates so much engagement. I'm not telling people to go out there and be wrong on purpose. But if you want to slip in a mispronunciation, people on the internet will lock onto it, and your video will get boosted from it. <laughs> That's some great advice. That's definitely <laughs> the, the engagement factor is so funny. It's it's insane, and it's impossible to figure out. But yeah, I, I would say if you're a small channel, <laughs> being wrong can sometimes be just as good as being right, maybe even better. That's fantastic. And okay, okay. One last question before you go. What's your favorite game sure. series of all time? Oh man, that's tough. Um, so I'm gonna have to go with have to go with Kingdom Hearts. And I I know how that sounds, and I know that 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 is a it's it. Okay, so I feel like I have to defend myself now. Kingdom Hearts <laughs> it, uh, was my favorite game <laughs> series growing up. I have been playing video games since before I can remember. My earliest memories are playing Game Boy. Um, I have been a longtime fan of all things Mario, all things Sonic, all things Final Fantasy. Uh, when Kingdom Hearts came out, I was 13 years old. And that game hit in all the right places for a 13-year-old in the early 2000s. 
Actually, it wasn't even the 2000s yet. I think that was like 90, 98. Anyway, Kingdom Hearts was my favorite game series the entire time. Like the, the entire lifespan of that series. Uh, I, I feel like 3 was the hardest fumble that series ever took. And I am cautiously optimistic to see what happens next. I'm glad that uh, <laughs> the series has such a Stellar War ally. <laughs> it's everything negative you can say about Kingdom Hearts is absolutely true. And I say that as a fan. I, I, I'd even go back and say it's not that good. I don't care. I still love it. And if you do not like Kingdom Hearts, I completely understand why. You're cool. I, you don't have to. <laughs> <laughs> Nostalgia is an important factor, after all. I mean, it is. It really is. And I. And you know what? If they come back and they make Kingdom Hearts four, and it's all going to like Final Fantasy worlds, and they cut Disney out of it, cool. Let's innovate. Let's do something new. <laughs> yeah, I mean, maybe it'll be awesome. Maybe it'll be revolutionary. It'll be the next Elden. We rank, don't know. You know. Uh, who knows? You know, Tetsuya Nomura just needs to get out of his comfort zone, man. Put put less belts on stuff and focus on some gameplay. Uh, I think that should be a quote somewhere. Put less belts on stuff and focus <laughs> on some gameplay. <laughs> oh, I, I'm also I, I'm also a staunch defender of what they're doing with the Final Fantasy VII remake. I love it. Um, I, I like the fact that they they didn't just hand us Final Fantasy VII in top graphics. Like they're trying to do something new, and I respect it. Yeah, I played the uh, whatever prologue where you just in the beginning city was released, but it was pretty cool. I really liked. I mean, like the graphic was the graphics were definitely there, and I don't know that much about the original beyond watching a speed run of it of all things. But I feel like it's faithful and innovative at the same time. Oh, it's it's super not faithful. It's super very innovative, but super not ah, faithful. But really? for, but in my opinion, for the right reasons. Okay, well I respect it, it that. It, yeah, it, well, no, it, it follows the game to a point, and then it goes completely off the rails, and it does it in a way where um, I, I, I'm on board for the journey. It, we could, we, uh, honestly, man, I could, I could talk to you for a whole other podcast episode about what they're doing with Final Fantasy VII Remake, but I, I won't subject you to that. <laughs> <laughs> I'm interested to hear a little if you think you can, like, you know, br cover some of the broader stuff. I, I can summarize. Um, you know how I was just just talking, a little, throwing a little shade at Tetsuya Nomura. I think it's fair to do even more that more of that with this, and I think it's a, a reason that the game isn't clicking with the entire community or didn't click with the entire community. What am I saying? It's been years since that came out. Um, they took the original story of Final Fantasy VII. They cut the first maybe third of it into one game, and we all knew that was going to happen. We knew they were going to drag this out over multiple games because that's what the gaming industry is now. You have to accept it to enjoy it. Um, Long story short, they have these ghosts that effectively make sure that the events of the first game are happening the way that they are supposed to, or of the original game are happening the way that they're supposed to. Every now and again, we have a scene where things seem like they're going to veer off from what happened in the original, and these like specters show up to make sure that it follows the correct path. We find out towards the end that y these things are making sure that whenever the events of Final Fantasy VII repeat themselves in all of these different universes, they happen the same way because it's the only way where the good guys win is the Final Fantasy VII that we played when we were all kids. The heroes of the Final Fantasy VII remake decide, no, we're going to choose our own fate, and they decide to break that chain of events. So whatever happens from here on out is open to new story. It's open to doing something new with these characters, and it will not follow the original Final Fantasy VII beat for beat. There are people who absolutely hate this. I, I like it, because I love these characters, and I want to see what they do, given the opportunity to write a different story. Yeah, that sounds like, you know, like, obviously it's going to depend a lot on what they choose to do, but I feel like it has a lot of potential in lending itself to the remake being fun for the people making it, so they could... But in the fact that they can sort of choose their own sort of chain of events. And it also just makes it into a fresh take overall. But I can see how, like, diehard fans might just completely reject that idea. Yeah, e even one of our Square Table guys is is super against the Final Fantasy VII remake, and it's always fun to argue with him about it. <laughs> <laughs> so valid. So is there a precedent for the parallel universes in the main, like, original game? Or is this just something that's completely out of left field with the ghosts guiding fate? It's out of left field given the story of Final Fantasy VII, but it's not out of left field if you consider what Final Fantasy as a series is. 
like it, it, if we kind of accept all of the all of the greater lore of what the Final Fantasy universe is and that the fact that all of these games take place in different universes and they take place in different times um the concept that there is multiple universes where Final Fantasy 7 is happening is acceptable it makes sense but you have to have that like galaxy mind view of it of this isn't just the world of Final Fantasy 7 this is Final Fantasy as a whole you know what i mean yeah i can see that I feel and like th even... there's people who don't like that. Like, but it's just yeah. like every Final Fantasy should be its own thing, and that's it. And I get it. I do. Well, I guess that's the. Uh, I'm glad you summarized it. That's sort of interesting. Maybe I'll have to like have you back on sometime to fully explain everything. <laughs> I I would love to. Um, the the entire compilation of Final Fantasy VII is my jam. I I really I I do love that entire aspect of uh, SquareSoft Square Enix. Yeah, it's really... Yeah, that's, that's how I age myself, call them squares. <laughs> squares. I've heard the term before, at the very least. Yeah. Yeah, my, my original copy of Kingdom Hearts still says it. <laughs> that's fantastic. Okay, well, thank you again for taking the time to come on, Zach. I uh, I appreciate all the conversation we've had. Um, I'm going to link, you know, all of your, uh, your YouTube channel, anything else you'd like down below. And if you'd like to shout out anything you have coming up or, you know, have any less comments, you know, feel free to share them now. Just thank you for having me on. This was a blast. Like this was a lot of fun. If you ever want to have me back, I will absolutely be back. Um, I don't get to talk about this stuff enough, so thank you. Um, in terms of future projects, I mean, I'm I'm working on. I still have my weekly lore videos, so every week you can expect an Elden lore. Um, we opened up memberships pretty recently that get you access to Elden lore two days early. Um, it's like three bucks a month, so you know we're not. <laughs> We're not breaking anybody's bank for early access to lore videos, but that's out there too now. Um, I think we're. I, I want to focus on creating a little more content around the Resident Evil Four remake that's coming out because I think Resident Evil Four kind of defined video games when it came out and like defined a future for what video games were going to be. And I want to see if they can capture that magic with the Resident Evil Four remake. Very excited about it. So. Uh, I would say expect some content from Square Table Gaming about the remake coming in the coming weeks. Alrighty, well you heard it here first. Go, uh, go check them out, get hyped, uh, and thanks again. I, um, I am very glad to have had you here. Thank you. And this has been episode 16 of Elden Kings, brought to you by Elden Ring Discussion and their sister subreddits. I'd like to thank everyone that listened this long, and I'd like to give a special thanks to Zach for joining me at the Roundtable Hold today. If you have an opinion, or simply liked what you heard, please leave a comment below. I heard uh, that it helps with the algorithm. And uh, stay tuned for next episode. I'm not sure who is lined up quite for now, but I'll try to get it out before the end of March, and if not, it'll be in the beginning of April. So, as always, thank you for watching, and uh, don't you dare go hollow on me.